Welcome to the Canadian Apprenticeship Forum's live web discussion of the business case for essential skills training in the skilled trades. Today we will share with you the findings from our upcoming report. The research explores the value of literacy and essential skills training for Canadian workers and was funded by the Office of Literacy and Essential Skills at Employment and Social Development Canada. My name is Sean Watson and thank you for joining us. I am pleased to welcome the many members of our organization who are in the audience today. Events such as these are made possible through the support of membership. If you would like to learn more about becoming a member of the Canadian Apprenticeship Forum, please visit our website or contact me directly for more information. During this webinar, attendees will not use their microphones in an effort to minimize noise on the presentation. If you would like to ask a question, please type it in the box on the webinar control panel. Your questions will be posed at the end of the presentation. The research we are learning about today is part of a broader Canadian Apprenticeship Forum initiative to build the business case for training, both from the employer and worker perspective. Looking at data sets with a specific focus on tradespeople is important to better understanding this group's experience in the labour market. Understanding the links between skills and a labour market outcome such as wages is important to shaping policies and programs around adult education, upgrading and workplace learning. For workers, it is important to know that better levels of literacy and essential skills do have a tangible benefit as it may be a motivating factor for pursuing or completing training. You will learn that research, the research builds a strong business case for training and will serve to inform our outreach efforts to promote the importance of literacy and essential skills. I would now like to introduce our guest presenters who worked in partnership with the Canadian Apprenticeship Forum on this research. Dr. Morley Gunderson is the CIBC Professor of Youth Employment at the University of Toronto. He is also a professor in the Department of Economics, the Centre for Industrial Relations and Human Resources, and the School of Public Policy and Governance. He is a research associate of, of the Centre for International Studies and the Institute for Human Development life course and aging, and a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada. Dr. Harry Krasinski is an associate professor at the University of Toronto in the Department of Management and the Centre for Industrial Relations and Human Resources. Welcome, Harry and Morley. Thank you. Thank you very much for having us. So, what we're going to talk about today uh, is a higher level uh, approach to characterizing uh, research that Morley and I have done on uh, the effect of literacy and essential skills on labor market outcomes for Canadian workers. Uh, some of you have been um, involved or have attended uh, various webinars or, or phone calls that we've, we've done to describe our research. Uh, basically, the research uh, has been uh, taking place over the last year and a half, approximately. Uh, we've used three different data sources to try to uh, think about this question, and uh, we have uh, written up individual reports on each uh, individual data source. Uh, today, what we're going to do is, in a sense, give you a, a report on the reports. We're going to give you a higher level summary of all of the reports. And if you're interested, uh, we can refer you to some of the individual reports if you'd like findings from uh, some of the individual data sources that we used. Uh, as well, uh, I got a note from Emily about uh, people who are attending uh, this webinar. Uh, and it's, uh, it's a mixed audience, so some of you are more technically inclined, others of you are more interested in simply hearing about the bottom line. I'm going to try to uh, uh, sort of give you an overall view of things. Uh, I may dip into some technical issues just to clarify exactly what we did, uh, but hopefully uh, we'll be able to get through all of the main issues uh, so that everybody can kind of get a sense of what it is exactly that we found. All right, so uh, basically, uh, as I said before, uh, the main thing that Morley and I tried to do was to analyze the impact of literacy and essential skills on uh, various labor market outcomes, uh, not only for all workers, 
but also for certain target groups within the labor market. Uh, and we tried to do this using uh, different data sources and also uh, different estimation approaches. What we're going to focus on today is uh, just generally monetary outcomes. And, and by the way, that's sort of the emphasis of the underlying reports uh, that we submitted to CAF. It's going to be, uh, we think, probably the, the best bottom line measure for success in, in evaluating uh, labor market success uh, and, and overall uh, labor market outcomes of any kind of program that you really want to think about. So those are the kinds of things that we're going to be uh, focusing on today. Now, in terms of the particular groups uh, that we wanted to look at, as I said before, we were thinking about not only all workers within the labor markets, but also certain target groups. Now, those groups uh, include, included the, the four that I have listed on this slide here. Uh, it includes immigrants, uh, Aboriginal persons, journey persons, and persons with disabilities. Uh, these groups are of interest for a number of reasons. Uh, immigrants, of course, uh, because as we found, uh, the recent cohorts of immigrants uh, are finding it increasingly difficult to integrate into the Canadian labor market in spite of the fact that they have generally higher levels of, of education and skills. And so thinking about the impact of uh, learning and essential skills uh, for, these, uh, for this particular group would be informative uh, to think about the way in which they integrate into the labor market. We want to think about Aboriginal persons uh, for a number of reasons, not least of which was because uh, they have a, a somewhat higher dropout rate from school uh, and also have a slightly uh, disadvantaged uh, status in, in the labor market. So thinking about the importance of LES for this group uh, is particularly apt. Uh, for journey persons, uh, some of whom have trained as apprentices, uh, we are interested in them because, of course, apprenticeship is attracting uh, a great deal of attention as a way to deal with uh, impending skill shortages, uh, also um, to provide vocationally oriented and, and a job-ready alternative to uh, conventional academic education, uh, where youth are sometimes having uh, problems with the school-to-work transition. So thinking hard about the way in which LES can help or not help uh, journey persons uh, is going to be uh, informative for the policy discussion as well as for making the business case for LES. Um, lastly, we wanted to think about persons with disabilities. Uh, these, uh, this particular group is of interest because of their generally disadvantaged status. Uh, we know that persons with disabilities on average exhibit uh, lower than average earnings in the labor market. Uh, and because of a general recognition, uh, that this group uh, can be a valuable source for addressing skill shortages. Uh, also, if it's the case that LES is beneficial for income uh, for this particular group, uh, then it would be pr particularly good to know that because it, it can potentially reduce their dependency on uh, government-funded income support, specifically disability insurance. So, in order to uh, address the question of whether or not there's a relationship between uh, LES and um, uh, labor market outcomes for not only all workers, but also the, the four target groups that we identified, uh, we wanted to analyze three different data sources. Uh, the first data source is a relatively new one. Uh, it's called the Program for the International Assessment of Adult Competencies, and, and we sometimes call it uh, the PIAC data for short. Uh, this was a data a source that was uh, basically overseen by the OECD uh, in order to think about uh, key uh, LES in the areas of literacy, numeracy, and problem solving in technology-rich environments. And what they did was they essentially ran this survey uh, across a whole series of different countries in order to get sort of a standardized measure of LES across countries and see how that was related to uh, sort of international uh, differences in, say, income or what have you. Uh, for our purposes, what we want to do is look at the Canadian data that was uh, amassed by uh, the OECD and think about the way in which uh, their measures of learning and essential skills 
uh, match up with uh, labor market outcomes, specifically monetary ones. Uh, so the, the outcome that we were going to think about within this data source is going to be hourly wages. Now, uh, you can always quibble if you want to think about how, how impactful certain things are on different monetary outcomes uh, and say, well, why are you using hourly wages? Why not something else? Uh, most of the time, researchers are, are sort of constrained by the data that they have and the information that is collected on their behalf. Uh, we're no different, and in this case, uh, the hourly wages were the sort of the key measure that was collected within the survey, so that's what we're going to go with, although we should add it's, it's probably a pretty good one. It, it has its merits from a, uh, a number of perspectives. Uh, I should say that the PIAC data is reasonably large. Uh, we were able to get a good amount of information on the general population as well as three target groups that we talked about. Uh, specifically, we were able to uh, get information on immigrants, Aboriginal persons, and journey persons. Uh, unfortunately, they did not collect any information on persons with disabilities, so our analysis of this particular data source didn't allow us to make any kind of meaningful statements uh, about the way in which LES impacted monetary outcomes for persons with disabilities. I should also say uh, that although journey persons were also in this data source, uh, they were a relatively small uh, group within the data source, and whenever you have relatively small numbers of observations, then you're, you're a little bit bound by how hard you can sort of push your conclusions. So I, I raise that point now as a little bit of foreshadowing for the results for this particular data source, uh, but not for others. So, uh, that's the, the way in which we proceeded with this particular data source, and we'll talk about the results from that in just a second. But first, I want to tell you about the other two data sources as well. So the second data source that we used uh, was the 2006 uh, census. Uh, now, uh, the beauty of the census is that it's uh, collected every five years by Stats Canada. Uh, of course, as we know, uh, the long form, the mandatory long form, that is, ended uh, after the 2006 census. We did not have the mandatory long form for the 2011 census, but we did for the 2006 census, and so that was the one that we went to. Uh, it was the one that we felt was, was most apt to use. It was going to be the most recent one that had uh, data that we could sort of trust as far as income was concerned, because again, remember, we're, we're focused on monetary outcomes in this case. Uh, as I said, uh, the, the beauty of the census is that it's quite large. Uh, the long form goes out to uh, one in five people, so we're, we're dealing with uh, the observations that are in the millions, uh, and it allowed us to really dig into uh, some of the smaller uh, samples that we would had before in the PIAC. Uh, in particular, it allowed us to uh, look at um, uh, journey persons as well as persons with disabilities, uh, in addition to people who are immigrants and Aboriginal persons. Uh, so all four of our target groups were, were very easily identifiable. We had a, a good amount of data uh, to look at them within uh, this data set. Um, the key outcome in this case uh, is going to be weekly earnings. Again, uh, as I alluded to before, uh, researchers are constrained by the information that's present in the data. Uh, the census does not go down to uh, hourly wages. The best we could do is to, to take weekly earnings. So uh, we'll take what we've got, and it's again, we, we feel very comfortable using that. But I should emphasize that this is a slightly different outcome measure than what we had uh, within the PIAC data. Uh, as I said, uh, there's information on the overall general population as well as all four target groups. This is a representative data set. Uh, it's intended to tell you about uh, everybody in the country in a representative way, so it has a lot going for it. Uh, the one drawback, of course, to the census is that it does not itself contain any information on uh, learning and essential skills. What it has uh, is basically just the, the, the kind of characteristics that we talked about. It has things like age, education, earnings, uh, and some other observables, but not LES. That was something that was collected in the PIAC data. So what we did in this case was we actually used a statistical technique that allowed us to merge in uh, uh, LES data into the census from the PIAC data. Uh, and for those of you who are more technically inclined, 
Uh, this is a method called two sample least squares. Uh, it's, it's one that's well established within the, the statistical literature as well as the economic literature. Uh, and uh, you know, we, we employed it here. Um, in addition, uh, because the census is so large, this is one of the data sets that we really, really liked. It allowed us to sort of think really hard um, about the policy question that's involved here. And the policy question that's involved is, uh, if we force people to get more uh, or better learning and essential skills, if we force them to get better LES, would it improve their, uh, their earnings? Would it improve uh, their wages? Uh, in this case, that's what we would call a causal question. So whereas in the PIAC data, we just simply wanted to look at correlations within our data to see whether or not people with higher LES had higher earnings as well, with the census, we wanted to think a little bit more deeply about that question. We wanted to ask, is it the case that if you randomly ask somebody to get more education, uh, or rather more, more LES, uh, would their earnings go up? Uh, and in this case, uh, the, the short answer is yes, it does. Uh, and uh, the size and the information available within the census data allowed us to uh, make some nice conclusions in that way. This is, in a way, uh, a preferred data set for us because of uh, this approach uh, that is a, the, the ability to draw out causal effects of LES on earnings was a really interesting thing for us. And we'll talk more about the specifics in a second, but that's a general uh, motivation for using the census data. The next data source that we used was called the National Graduate Survey. Now, uh, the National Graduate Survey uh, is a survey that is conducted by Statistics Canada. And what they do is they survey individuals who have graduated from different post-secondary programs uh, including some professional programs. Um, and the beauty of this particular survey is that what it, what it does is it seeks out graduates of programs both two and five years after they graduate from the program. Uh, this is really nice because it introduces what's called the longitudinal aspect to our analysis. Or more simply, it allows us to track people over time. And what we can do is to sort of use this data to look at the ways in which our outcome measure, that is earnings, evolves over time and whether or not that's related to the LES. So for instance, in this case, we might, we might not only be interested in whether or not somebody has higher earnings if they have higher LES. We might also want to know, do they have higher wage growth uh, if they have higher LES as well? And the National Graduate Surveys could allow us to sort of dig into that type of question. Now here, uh, we have an outcome measure that's related to earnings, uh, but it's annual earnings. Uh, and again, we're constrained by the information that's collected for us. Uh, the National Graduate Surveys don't collect weekly or hourly earnings. Uh, this was the cleanest measure that we could obtain as far as um, uh, trying to get uh, a good outcome measure, so that was the one that we went with. Uh, it's going to be different than the census and different than the, uh, the PIAC data, uh, but again, you're sort of constrained by what you have. Uh, that's not necessarily a bad thing, it's just it, you have to sort of take our, our conclusions in the context of the outcome variable, that this is annual earnings, not weekly or hourly. Uh, the, uh, the good news is that uh, the NGS has information about the various target groups, uh, but not always uh, for all years. So for instance, we were able to get information on journey persons, but only in one of the uh, supplements of the NGS. Uh, we used uh, uh, three different, uh, sorry, uh, we used four different supplements. Uh, the NGS, uh, analyzed people who graduated from a program in 1990, and then did it again to look at people who graduated from a program in 95, in 2000, and also in 2005. So we have uh, four different cohorts of graduates. Uh, unfortunately, not, like I said, not everybody is, is uh, surveyed in every single year. For instance, uh, the apprentices, rather I should say the journey persons, are only uh, briefly uh, surveyed in the 1990 cohort, but none of the others. Uh, and again, this is, you're, you're sort of constrained by what you have, but 
uh, that's that's one of the potential drawbacks of the NGS. Okay, and I should also say that like the uh, uh, the census, the NGS did not contain information on LES. We had to merge that in into the uh, NGS from the PIAC, uh, and and we were able to do so using that method that I talked about before. And so again. It, uh, it, it was, it's a well-established method, and we feel very confident in the results. Okay, so we've now talked about um, the, the data sets that we used. Uh, what I should talk about now is uh, some of the ways in which we sort of thought about LES. Within the PIAC data, there are really uh, a, sort of two different approaches for thinking about uh, LES. The first approach involves a survey that was sent out to everybody who uh, responded to the, the, the PIAC uh, questionnaire, and it asked them uh, how much they did in terms of certain activities. So it would ask them, how much do you read at work, do you email at work, uh, how much do you do as a way of, in the way of calculations. And from these various questions, what the survey did was created a rough uh, estimate of each respondent's uh, LES along eight different skill measures. And those eight different measures are, are listed for you on this slide. They included uh, reading, writing, document use, numeracy, information and communications technology, planning, learning at work, and also uh, the ability to influence other people at work. Uh, so again, based on what people reported in the PIAC as far as their activities at work, the individuals who ran the PIAC created uh, various metrics of each of these eight skills. So these are self-reported skills and there are eight of them. Now in our reports, ultimately what we did was we looked at eight each of the eight individual skills. As you might imagine, it was a very tough challenge because uh, many of the skills overlap in, in many ways. Uh, as well, uh, it, it's sort of hard to know which skill is sort of a dominant one if you're looking at a relatively small group, or, or rather a group that has relatively small numbers of observations associated with it. Uh, so what we did to sort of simplify things was we basically made an index measure. And the way in which we made an index is we took the sum of each of these eight self-reported skills. So whatever uh, the PIAC assigned as your score for reading or as your score for writing, we took each of those scores, we added them up for each of the eight variables, and we called that our index for the eight self-reported skills. So that was one way in which we were able to get a handle on the way in which LES was measured within the PIAC data. The other way in which uh, the PIAC measured uh, LES was uh, actually a much more clinical way. Uh, the way in which uh, the, the clinical way of measuring took place was they actually had people uh, complete standardized tests. Uh, so these are, as you can see on the slide in the second bullet point, uh, psychometric tests. And these were uh, given to everybody. They had to complete these psychometric tests. Uh, to test your literacy and numeracy skills. And so what they did was they assigned people uh, a score based on how well they did on these tests. Uh, and we took the sum of those two scores as a different index. So whereas we had a, an index based on the eight self-reported scores, uh, we also had an index based on the two psychometric tests. Now the last bullet point requires a, a little bit of explanation. So the way in which uh, the PIAC attempted to institute these, uh, uh, these standardized tests was to have people actually complete them online. Now not everybody is computer literate, uh, so for those who couldn't complete the test online, we only had uh, literacy and numeracy skills for them. For people who were able to complete the test online, uh, they were also uh, tested in a third dimension, and that was uh, for problem solving in a technologically uh, rich environment. 
uh, as well as the literacy and the numeracy skills. So essentially, if you want to think about it, uh, what this problem solving is, is sort of thinking about ways in which you could use technology. So for instance, using an Excel spreadsheet uh, to complete a particular task. Uh, so for some people, in fact, for, for the vast majority, uh, they were able to, to complete all three types of standardized tests. Uh, and uh, for them, what we did was we took the sum of these three scores in order to give us an index of their overall LES. So uh, these three indices that, we're, that I just talked about here, these are really uh, the go-to measures that we have uh, for our data. Uh, and again, it's in part because looking at the individual uh, abilities that we're talking about are, are sometimes quite challenging, uh, especially because the skills are not independent of one another. So uh, the, the index are the results that we'll talk about today. And of course, if you want to think about or, or read more about what the individual things do, uh, the individual skills rather do, we would refer you to the reports uh, at this time. So let's talk about uh, methodology in this case. Uh, what we did in order to think about the way in which uh, LES uh, is going to impact earnings or wages uh, is to use uh, a regression analysis. So this is a, a similar methodology that's used for all three data sets. So uh, I'll talk briefly about this, and again, I'll apologize for those who are not really interested in the, the methodological aspects, but it is important that I kind of uh, go through the, the brass tacks of things so you're aware of what we did. Uh, basically, what we wanted to do is we wanted to think about how LES uh, had an independent effect on the different measures of, LE, of, of earnings outcomes after controlling for other factors that could also impact earnings. So for instance, what we might want to do is we might want to see how our indices uh, were related to earnings after controlling for other things like uh, age uh, or education or gender or, or what province you lived in or what have you. Uh, there are all kinds of things that can impact our earnings. We wanted to try to control for those things uh, in addition to simply thinking about uh, the relationship between, say, LES and uh, learning outcomes. Uh, the main results that we would that we want to sort of bring to uh, everyone's attention uh, is that uh, regardless of how we measured LES, and regardless, by and large, of whatever group we looked at, uh, what we can say is that we almost always found positive and statistically significant and also quantitatively large effects of LES on the various measures of earnings that we had in all three data sets. So we should, we should emphasize that this result was evident for all three data sets, that is the PIAC, the census, and the NGS. It was, it was present for all three indices of LES that I talked about before, that is the index based on eight self-reported skills, the index based upon only literacy and numeracy skills, as well as the index based upon all three of these skills all together. Uh, so uh, in, in most research, it's, it's sometimes a bit of a quandary. You sometimes find positive results in some cases uh, and less so in others. Uh, with our indexes, we had no such reservations and no such problems. Uh, it was uh, a lot of evidence that all went in the same way. Uh, it was remarkably consistent and, and, and again, quite robust that we want to say that LES has a very positive impact on, on pay. So that's an important thing, uh, not only for uh, uh, stakeholders to know, but also for, for workers uh, to know as well. So um, what are we talking about in this case as far as magnitudes? Well, as I said before, uh, one of the things that we tried to do uh, was we tried to think about ways in which we could, we could measure how uh, LES was related to earnings outcomes in causal ways. That is to say, if we forced people to get more LES, uh, what would that do to their earnings? So if you took a worker that you have right now and put them through a training program, what would we expect, uh, what would we expect to, to change 
uh, with respect to their earnings. Um, what we did was, again, we used a, a statistical procedure called instrumental variables in order to do that. And what we played around with was this idea that uh, in the past, we thought that perhaps it was the case that LES was enhanced by mandatory schooling laws. That is to say, by forcing people to get more schooling, uh, this may force them to acquire better numeracy skills, better literacy skills, better problem solving skills, and what have you. So thinking about people who are forced to get more schooling and as such increase their LES, we looked at how their outcomes compare to people who say we're not forced to get different schooling. To give you a concrete example, let's think about what has happened in the past. So one of the big changes that we saw in Canadian education law was that the dropout age changed from, say, 14 to 16. So if I was to try to drop out at 14, I might have a certain level of LES. If my brother is forced to get two more years of education and can't drop out until he's 16, then what, in a sense, you can do is look at whether or not uh, that those two extra years of education uh, cause us to have different levels of LES, and then think about how that change in LES may have altered his earnings compared to mine. So when you sort of play around with that sort of uh, thought experiment, this is essentially what we did in the census. We exploited those changes in the laws and saw whether or not they, they pushed around LES. What I can tell you is they absolutely did. That is, the people who are forced to get more education or that is more training in general, they have better LES. And furthermore, if you push up their LES, then this causes their earnings to go up. So for instance, if you take the index for the sum of all eight self-reported schools, uh, skills rather, uh, for a one standard deviation increase in the LES index for all people, this leads to a 16% increase in their uh, weekly earnings or an increase of, say, $112 from the average of $702 to $814. Uh, the effects are slightly smaller uh, for each of the target groups. Uh, it was only a 13.6% effect for people with disabilities, 132 for Aboriginal persons, 11.9 uh, uh, for uh, journey persons, and 9.3 for immigrants. Uh, what we saw as well was that uh, if you thought about uh, the index for the sum of the literacy and numeracy uh, psychometric test scores, again, uh, the causal effect there was uh, positive and very large and significant. If you could push up those scores, this could give rise to a, approximately a 16% increase in the earnings of all persons. And similarly, if we looked at the that third index that I talked about of literacy, numeracy, and problem-solving scores. If you could push up that index, it gave rise to a 9.7% increase in earnings. Now, we should talk a little bit uh, about um, some of the, the general findings that we had. Oops, I'm sorry, I advanced the slide by accident. Um, there, not everybody uh, followed exactly the same patterns. Um, Specifically, Aboriginal persons and journey persons uh, were somewhat uh, of outliers uh, within this discussion. And so I should say that although the effects are fairly uniform for all the target groups and generally are showing positive and statistically significant large effects, uh, for Aboriginal persons, uh, the effect of the psychometric test skills uh, were essentially zero in the census estimates. Uh, in contrast, for journey persons, the effects of these skills were by far the largest of all our groups. Uh, so if you want to think about why this may be the case, uh, I would point to a couple of things. Uh, first of all, the, uh, the procedure that we used, that is looking at the way in which changes in mandatory schooling laws uh, altered uh, your skills, that relationship was weakest within our Aboriginal sample. So what we saw was that, generally speaking, as the uh, mandatory schooling laws changed, uh, you did not see a, a big effect on Aboriginal persons uh, in terms of their LES. And so that, that undercuts slightly some of the things that we are doing. Nevertheless, uh, it suggests that uh, we want to be careful 
with the way in which we uh, stress our, our conclusions here. Uh, it's possible as well uh, that the nature of the work that we see for Aboriginal persons in our data, that is in the census, we saw a predominant amount of work within the resource sectors or the job churning uh, of the large number of young Aboriginal persons or, or the fact that the somewhat higher dropout rate and lower educational attainment for Aboriginal persons that may inhibit their acquisition of, of LES skills, that may undercut the effects that we're seeing here. Uh, in contrast, uh, like I said, for journey persons, the effects of these skills are large uh, and, and, and very important. Um, if we were to suggest uh, a solution here uh, for you know, what is uh, going to be, what, what we would recommend, uh, what we would say is that, uh, as you can see from the slide, there's no one size fits all solution to all of this. Uh, if we want to estimate uh, the independent effects of, say, uh, literacy, numeracy, and problem solving skills, uh, it's, made di it's made difficult because uh, they're so uh, interrelated with one another. So in the past, uh, we've been asked the question, well, you know, what skills should we emphasize for our workers? Should we uh, emphasize numeracy training? Should we emphasize literacy training? Uh, should we emphasize problem solving training? Uh, the answer is it's, it's hard to know. Uh, and we have some suggestions about this uh, in a couple of slides, but what we would say is that, again, because all of these skills are so closely interrelated with one another, uh, it's very difficult to say that one is the dominant skill, whereas the other one is not. We tend to think that they all uh, sort of interrelate, and, and training on, on one aspect is going to help training on another aspect. So in this case, uh, what we would say is that this notion of a one-size-fits-all solution is really just not appropriate. Uh, if you want to talk about some key takeaways here, uh, the message for, for tradespeople is that uh, based on the census uh, data, and uh, this, is, this is, like I said, our, our, our preferred estimates for, causing, uh, uh, for looking at the way in which LES impacts earnings, uh, what we saw was that there's a big effect for journey persons, uh, and this highlights the importance of investing in LES uh, prior to training, during training, and part, as a part of lifelong learning. Uh, employers should also be encouraged to foster LES in all of these stages. Uh, in short, uh, the limited evidence suggests that uh, the problem-solving skills are particularly important uh, for journey persons, although, like I said, we want to uh, have some caution with how hard we push on one particular skill. Uh, the takeaway for Aboriginal persons in this case is that uh, what we saw was that in, in the PIAC and NGX data, although LES are generally associated with higher pay for Aboriginal persons, uh, it was only through the index of the eight self-reported skills uh, in the preferred estimates from the census that we actually saw uh, some uh, meaningful causal relationships. In the other case, uh, not so, and so we're concerned that uh, uh, more research may be necessary in this case in order to think uh, harder about whether or not uh, LES is helping Aboriginal persons. As we talked about before, uh, this notion of the, the types of jobs that Aboriginal persons hold uh, in comparison with non-Aboriginal persons or the type of job churning that we see for a large number of Aboriginal persons uh, that may have contributed to the uh, less robust relationship between LES and uh, labor market outcomes in this case. Uh, so I think what we want to do is just be uh, careful with, with how, we, how we interpret these findings but say that we saw uh, less of a relationship here, uh, but we're concerned that, that this lack of a relationship may be due to some extenuating factors. Uh, for immigrants, the key takeaway that we want to uh, bring to bear in this case uh, is that uh, higher LES consistently fosters higher pay for immigrants uh, based on all three data sets, all three indices of LES, and in clearly we want to take this as, as strong evidence for highlighting the importance of LES in fostering the integration of immigrants into the Canadian labor market uh, and perhaps should be considered a part of their entry requirements but also a part of subsequent lifelong learning.
if we were to take, think about the takeaway for persons with uh, disabilities, uh, in this case what we would say is that uh, higher LES is associated with higher pay for persons with a disability based on uh, the two data sets, that is the census and uh, the NGS, uh, that have information on persons with disabilities and for all three indices. And uh, as before, this clearly highlights the importance of LES to foster their integration into the Canadian labor market uh, and ameliorate their standard of living and to fill labor shortages. Uh, it, in terms of the next steps for uh, the apprenticeship uh, uh, programs, uh, what we would suggest is that uh, in order to create uh, better apprentice uh, data, we would uh, uh, suggest giving consideration uh, to the following potential initiatives, that is establishing some baseline data on essential skills as well as mid-training data for apprentices at each level, and then once they complete their apprenticeship to evaluate their LES development and look at any links between LES and completion. We think that it would be important to do more data collection by trade to determine which essential skills matter the most to specific trades, and we want to try, we would suggest thinking about ways in which to replicate the detailed data that were uh, collected in the 2006 census. Uh, as well, it would be informative to distinguish the results for journey persons who receive their status through the normal route of completing an apprenticeship as opposed to being a trade qualifier who challenged the exam uh, based on su uh, sufficient experience in the trade. I want to thank uh, Emily and Sean for organizing uh, this conference, or at this, this webinar, I should say, and I want to thank the audience for their attention. Uh, and I think I'll turn it back to Emily and Sean at this point. Thank you so much, Harry and Morley, uh, for your hard work on this presentation today. Joining us now is Emily Aerosmith, the Canadian Apprenticeship Forum's researcher and project manager, who will pose some questions that have come in during the session. Hi, um, Harry. So uh, somebody is asking, it, within the data sets, is it possible to examine the underemployed who might not fit into any of the groups that you identified, uh, but still are a group where we want to see greater participation in the labor force and greater literacy and essential skills? Is there any way to identify underemployed in the data set? Uh, yeah, so um, I think that I'll, I'll give uh, a quick answer and then um, Morley may also want to have something to say about this as well. Um, it, it depends on what you mean by underemployed. That's always a very tricky topic uh, because there's a little bit of subjectivity to that. Uh, so when we talk about the underemployed, oftentimes it's those who sort of self-report as being underemployed. That is. You, you typically ask people a question, are you, are you working as much as you would otherwise like? And they'll, they'll tell you one way or the other. Um, the problem in this case is that uh, our preferred uh, data source, that is the census, is uh, less optimal for that. It, it does not ask people, are you overemployed or are you underemployed? Are you working as much as you would otherwise like? So in that sense, uh, we are somewhat constrained. Uh, however, uh, I know that there are uh, potentially other data sets where they will talk about cases of uh, overemployment. I believe, if my memory is correct, that the NGS at some uh, point asks about over and underemployment. Uh, the problem, of course, with the NGS is that it's a somewhat smaller data source compared to the census. Uh, so you're a little bit constrained in that way. Now, if you wanted to make a, a more broad uh, a classification of underemployment, you could look at, for instance, people uh, who had full-time employment as opposed to those who did not. Uh, and that might be one way to sort of think about this issue. So you could sort of look at the uh, look at workers who were predominantly in part-time employment or look at workers uh, who were, uh, as we would say, less, less attached to the labor market, that is those who uh, didn't have um, a, a, a strong number of weeks in which they were working, you, you could uh, replicate the exercise within that group. But I, I would repeat my earlier um, 
concern. That is that, again, this notion of over and under employment, it does fall prey to some subjectivity. Marley, do you want to add anything to that? Uh, yeah, the one thing I would add is I believe that two other data sets, the WES, or Workplace and Employee Survey, and SLID, the Survey of Labor and Income Dynamics, do have questions on uh, uh, people being underemployed. As you say, it's a subjective question. They, they ask things like, uh, would you like to work longer hours? Sometimes they say at the going wage rate. Uh, for that, and sometimes they don't. So it's possible. Uh, one could explore that perhaps in other data sets, but I don't think there's more that we could do with these data sets on that. Okay, perfect. Um, I've had another uh, question come in. Um, could you um, share your thoughts with us on this whole notion of uh, literacy and essential skills and completion rates, which as you know are a, a big issue in the apprenticeship community. Um, Statistics Canada shows the rates to be about 50%, so we're always interested in ways that we can improve completion rates. If we wanted to link this idea of literacy and essential skills to the completion of apprentices at a very high level, uh, what are your thoughts? Could we do a study like that? And just at a very high level, what would it look like? Uh, Morley, do you want to do you want to start first, or do you want me to? Uh, yeah, I could I could take a first stab at that. Yeah. Uh, the data on completion rates usually comes from surveys that are only of apprentices, so you wouldn't have a comparison group to deal with on that. But I do believe uh, it would be possible to connect uh, again, probably using the two sample least squares method. Uh, some of the LES measures to uh, the completion rates. Uh, I have not, I have definitely not seen that done. I'm reasonably familiar with the studies on completion rates, uh, so I do think that's an area of potential further research. Yeah, yeah, I, I you know, I, I agree with Morley. Um, you know, I think that it's uh, obviously this is a very important question. Obviously, we'd like to know whether or not. Um, Better training is uh, important for completion. I know that when um, I, I participate in a roundtable about this, there was a question about whether or not uh, we ought to see um, apprenticeship programs uh, taken uh, much more formally into the, the college system uh, in order to, to sort of have better control over the, the training that takes place. Um, I, so I think that what Morley alluded to is, is the, the big thing. The, that is, if you wanted to take something like this seriously, uh, what you would really want to do is think hard about, uh, again, establishing uh, a baseline, thinking about before uh, a cohort entered into the training phase of an apprenticeship, what their LES looked like. That would not be hard at all. You could simply replicate what the PIAC did. Uh, and then uh, you could think uh, about ways in which uh, you could potentially enhance the training given to one group as opposed to another. And this whole notion of comparing sort of treatment and control, that would really give you uh, a very convincing and uh, important uh, study on this, this whole idea of LES and how it's related to uh, uh, completion. And then you could sort of see at the end if, if somebody who had better training, uh, were they more likely to complete? And, and also, you know, um, were they uh, more or less likely to be sort of a, uh, I forget the exact phrase, I think a, a long-term uh, uh, participant is, is the, the, the way I'm thinking about it. Basically, somebody who enters a program uh, and it's not that they have left it, it's just that they're, they, they haven't really finished it. So it's um, you could, uh, you could sort of think about it in that regard. I think it would be certainly feasible, uh, and, and not only that, it would be very important. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, uh, we've had a question. Is there a connection between pay and return on training investment for employer to be training their employees in, in literacy and essential skills? And uh, the Canadian Apprenticeship Forum recently did a study on that and asked employers about the costs and benefits related to essential skills training uh, for their employees. And in the survey, we asked employers about formal essential skills training programs 
that they offered to their employees separate um, from the work that their employees were doing. And the employers who participated in the study and who were able to report on the costs and benefits uh, did show a positive relationship. So employers did feel that there was a positive financial benefit uh, to investing in essential skills for their employees. The one uh, challenge is that only 45% of employers were offering any kind of formal literacy and essential skills training to their employees, and the other half of employers uh, didn't think literacy and essential skills had anything to do with working in the trades and uh, weren't really open to the possibility. Uh, so that's a challenge for the apprenticeship community, definitely. Um, we, in sharing information about the business case with employers to really show, yeah, there are a lot of uh, uh, benefits to your business if you uh, do invest in this kind of training. Now we've had two more questions come up about this whole, this finding about the Aboriginal groups and the literacy and essential skills. Um, one person's made a really good comment. They're saying that Perhaps one of the reasons um, that uh, the findings are a bit unclear is the census doesn't really have good outreach um, in terms of getting Aboriginal uh, peoples to fill in the census perhaps, and maybe the data isn't as rich um, in, in representing Aboriginal people's experiences as it could be, so this might be a limitation in the data. Um, and then another person is, is just asking for, for more clarification on this sort of curious finding um, for the Aboriginal peoples about the relationship between less and wages. Um, well, I guess uh, I'll begin with the first comment, uh, which is, you know, what, is it possible that um, a poor, uh, a less uh, decent um, uh, completion rate or, or less decent representation of the census for Aboriginal persons, would that be a problem? Uh, the short answer is yeah, for sure. Uh, if it's the case that uh, the census is not um, making the appropriate uh, inroads to get a representative sample of Aboriginal persons, um, then that would certainly undercut uh, some of the, the work. Um, so I think that if there are concerns about that, then you know certainly we would have to acknowledge that that's a potential limitation as well. Um, you know, it, it, I guess the only thing you would say in its defense is that it's, it, you know, uh, thinking about Aboriginal persons was um, certainly a, an important goal for this study, and um, trying to get uh, the best data that we can, even if it's not optimal, uh, was certainly uh, one of our, our goals, and so. Um, you know, I think that we sort of, we as researchers, empirical researchers, do the best that we can, um, and uh, this is unfortunately sort of the best we, we've got. Uh, fail, failing some some alternative survey that that simply uh, does a better job in that way. Um, yes, I guess exactly. I I know we have to uh, start wrapping it up to go back to Sean Harry, but. Um, uh, you did uh, mention this idea that if you maybe separated uh, younger Aboriginal workers from older Aboriginal workers, there potentially could identify some uh, differences. And really, the types of jobs in the resource sector that Aboriginal peoples are doing could potentially have a, a big impact on the results, as well as their uh, uh, lower levels of completion of high school, that that's really impacting their ability to acquire basic literacy and essential skills. Yep. Correct? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Uh, so if, please, if you have any more uh, questions, please feel free to uh, email us and we will follow up and ensure that you get answers. Now I'd like to pass it back over to uh, Sean. Thanks, Emily, uh, and thanks again, everyone uh, that contributed here today. Uh, the full report on today's research will be available on our website this April. Next up in our webinar series, on February 24th, the discussion will be around best practices of employment, employer engagement in apprenticeship. Then on March 25th, tune in to learn about the Canada Apprentice Loan with a guest presenter from the federal government's Canada Student Loans Program. On February 26th, we are in St. John's at the Sheraton Hotel, Newfoundland. At this event, we will further explore employer engagement in apprenticeship training with a panel and roundtable discussion.
The focus will be on the challenges and benefits of training in today's workplace, and results will inform the next phase of our employer engagement strategy. Space for this event is limited, and you will need to pre-register. For more information on that, you can uh, check the Canadian Apprenticeship Forum website. Finally, uh, this webinar was recorded today, and we will send out a copy to all participants later this week. And, and again, I just want to say, say thank you to uh, Harry and Morley and Emily and for everyone joining us today.